Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcasts, where we interview movers and shakers and diverse change makers. I'm Deborah Levine, the founder and editor of the American Diversity Report. And with me today is Charlie Bueller, a woman of color in the film industry. She was strongly influenced by her upbringing as a biracial woman growing up in a predominantly white area in South Dakota. Charlie Bueller uses her work to make sense of the dichotomy between how she experienced the world and how the world experienced her through the lenses of race and gender. Welcome, Charlie. Well, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. A pleasure. So tell us, how did you get involved in the filmmaking industry? Well, when I was young, you know, growing up in South Dakota, I didn't even think being a director was a possibility for me. You know, it's, there's no films are made there. Um, I always thought of Hollywood as kind of like Oz or Never Never Land. It's like somewhere, someplace far away, they make movies, but that's not a job that we have. Um, and so initially, you know, if you get good grades in South Dakota, you become a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, or a farmer. Like there's very few um, pathways that you can take. But, and my dad's a doctor. And so I always thought that that's what I would do. Um, but I went to Notre Dame and on my first day, I took a chemistry class, like my first chemistry class, the first day. And I was just like, I don't love this. Like, it's just not, I could probably do it and get good grades and become a doctor, but my heart's not in it. And I, and, and I realized that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life being a doctor. And I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I just knew it wasn't that. Um, and so at Notre Dame, you have to take a fine art. And I, I made my fine art film. And in my film classes, I realized, oh, this is actually a job that people that you can do. And there's different, there's different jobs within this industry. And so that was the th thing that first got film on my radar. Um, so I dropped my pre-med major, became a film major. And, uh, and I just knew I wanted to direct. And I knew I had always loved movies. And I think when I was a kid, I had just written myself off because one, I didn't ever see South Dakotans in movies, but two, I never saw my version of South Dakota in a movie, which is you know, being a brown person from South Dakota. And so because I had, you know, never seen myself, it didn't seem like it was possible. Um, but so I, you know, once I had made the decision, I changed my major. After I graduated, drove out to Hollywood, you know, kind of the traditional story, worked in bars and restaurants and lots of odd jobs uh, in order to get here where I am today. Wonderful. Go you. <laughs> Thank How you. long is that drive? Uh, it, we did it over the course of three days. Um, because it's not, I mean, there's beautiful things between South Dakota and Los Angeles. So we would stop in Denver, we stopped in the Grand Canyon, we okay. stopped in Utah, uh, and then finally made it. So we drew it out, but, you know, took advantage of how beautiful it was. Great. So, um, a lot of your work is, is rooted in representation. Tell us a little bit about the importance of representation on screen and what this looks like in relation to your own experience. Well, I think going back to what I was saying is that I never saw myself reflected in images on screen. And in fact, you know, the only time I ever saw brown people, it was, you know, in, in ways that, that, that uh, made them seem violent, made them, you know, living in poverty, living under distress. And so I internalized that and I thought, I always felt like I was too rural to be a, a real black person and too brown to be a real South Dakotan because the images were telling me South Dakotans are white and brown people live in cities. And, and so I always felt like this sense of not knowing how I fit in or how I belonged. And that's really hard for a kid, you know, because you want, you, you're trying to formulate your identity. And when people are telling you what you're supposed to do and what, what you're supposed to look like, how you're supposed to behave, and your experience doesn't fit those things, um, it can just make you feel really lost and alone. And so, um, and so in my work, because my experiences, you know, I think 
it's one that lots of people share. Like I, a lot of my friends are Native Americans who live in South Dakota as well. So there's lots of brown people there that are just kind of overlooked. And so I love to find, you know, niche, little niche populations that are living in ways that sort of usurp expectations. Um, and so I worked with the Compton Cowboys, who are these wonderful guys in Compton who are fat, like fantastic um, rodeo riders. And they live like right in the middle of Compton. They've been there forever, for, since the 80s. And um, whenever people would go to Compton, like if you go there, you will see people riding horses down the street. It's not that odd, especially in certain pockets of Compton. But, <laughs> you know, but when films would go there, they would only point their camera at the things that they wanted to point them at. Um, and so they obviously ignored the fact that there's like also kind of like a rural culture in Compton too. And, um, and I have friends on the reservation in South Dakota who are fantastic rappers and hip hop is huge on the reservation. Really? And, you know, and so I think when people are in South Dakota, they think, oh, country music, white people, cornbread, white pick, white picket fences. <laughs> but you know, there's this whole community of brown people there who are very much have, have adopted um, black culture and black music and black style and way of dress. And, um, and, you know, because hip hop speaks to, to the Native American community much more closely than country music would. Yeah. Uh, it also, you know, found uh, a connection to that style of music and they're really good. And so, you know, so that's, you know, hip hop in South Dakota and, and these amazing African-American um, rodeo riders in Compton are like things that people, you know, little worlds that people don't know exist um, because they haven't taken the time to like really go and explore it. And I think that's so important for kids to see because the more that we can, you know, explore these little micro world worlds, the more that we can realize that our experiences are so universal. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely, yes. I really appreciate that. I grew up on the island of Bermuda. Mm -hmm. I was the only Jewish little girl on the entire island. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you, you, and then when you're trying to figure out like how you're supposed to be, you know, because that, you know, we, we, we learn from our peers. We learn from how, you know, what the world is telling us that people like us like who, who people like us are, whatever that means, you know? And, and, and that's also reinforced by the stories that we tell, which is why I think that filmmakers have such a responsibility because whether you like it or not, you're saying something. And it's what, you, what do you choose to say, you know? Even if it's a comedy, you're saying something. Oh yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. These are cultural expressions that contain incredible amount of information in just a small little space, a graphic, a, a joke, a whatever piece of music. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can't say that, that we had rap music back in the day on the island, <laughs> but we had Calypso. Yeah. Yeah. And it's beautiful uh, music. It's wonderful. Exactly. And my brother named his photography studio the Calypso studio. How could he not, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we retain it, right? Mm -hmm. We retain it. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about a, maybe a specific incident or issue that you've retained over these years from those days. I think, you know, I, I think it's, I experienced like little pockets of racism when I was a kid. Um, that was overt in South Dakota, but it's more, I think, like the micro things, like, you know, the perceptions of beauty not being, being blue-eyed blondes and not feeling pretty because, you know, all of the beautiful girls on TV looked a certain way and that's not how I looked, which also reinforced like how the boys felt beauty was supposed to be. And so like me and my sisters, my sister weren't asked, in, you know, out on dates. I didn't get asked to prom. Oh. Um, like those like little things that, it, it, it's not overtly racist, obviously. And, and as a kid, you don't think, oh, it's because uh, the perceptions of beauty are skewed by the representation. You know, like that's not how you see it. You just think, oh, well, beautiful people look this way. And girls with curly hair uh, and brown skin and brown eyes, that's not, that's not what beauty is. And so I always, I begged my mom to let me dye my hair blonde. Yeah. And, she, <laughs> and I begged her to let me straighten my hair. And she's like, no, you cannot do that. Thank God she didn't let me do it. <laughs> but, you know, it's experiences like that where uh, in these micro ways you're not seeing yourself and so you feel like you need to change. 
Um, you know, and also as a kid, I didn't really look like either side of my family. You know, my mom's, my mom's black and my dad's white. And so even within your own family, you don't really feel like you belong because <laughs> in families are supposed to look like, you know, and, and our family didn't. And so, um, and so I think in those sort of like little ways that you, it, you wouldn't necessarily overtly say that that's racism, but it's all tied to, uh, especially like how back when I was a kid, um, like who love interests were, was all t tied to racist ideas. Mm, I see, yes. I understand very well. I, I didn't feel I fit, fit into my family too. And I informed my mother that it was really a mistake that I had been kidnapped as a child. Yeah. Would she please return me to my rightful <laughs> owners? Yeah. <laughs> it can't possibly be you guys. Exactly. I think I felt that way. Like, I'm a princess somewhere. Where is my castle? <laughs> yes, exactly what I said too. <laughs> I love it. So what is the power of film in portraying all of this on screen to change the culture, to give more complex understanding to the public? Well, I think, you know, our stories inform us about our ideals, but they also reinforce ideas. And so it's kind of like this feedback loop where we can see what, what the dominant ideas in culture are. Um, but then also once films are, are, you know, portraying black people as violent thugs or Native Americans living in poverty or white people being the people who are in power or women being only love interests and their only uh, purpose should be to get married. Like those things also reinforce those ideas in our culture. And I think the more we're seeing different perspectives and more nuance, the more we're able to, to connect to other, to other communities, you know, like, I feel like um, this country is so divided in this moment. And a lot of it has to do with no one knowing anyone with any other beliefs, everyone living in echo chambers. And so, you know, I'm as someone from South Dakota. A lot of my family and friends, people I grew up with are Republican because that's, you know, the dominant politics in that state. And all, a lot of my friends in California are liberal. And neither side understands each other at all. And I, think, and I think the reason why we sort of treat our politics like war is because um, it's, it's difficult for either side to, to really understand each other. And, um, and I think the more that films do that, like the more films are centered in rural America, the more films that are set, set in, you know, the more rom-coms we have about uh, the Asian community or different communities, the more we're able to see that, oh, these people aren't that different from us. It's hard to demonize people who, who we recognize. Exactly. You know, it's much easier to, to demonize people who seem completely like others. And, um, and I think that you would find that in film. And, um, you know, and the more and more we see it, I think the harder it will be to create such divisiveness. I think you're right. Are you yourself in the film? I'm not in it, no. No, not in I, it. Yeah, I just directed it. Ah, what was it like to be a director? It was, I mean, it's my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, to be able to see something from, be, see something through from idea all the way through inception. Um, and to sort of, it's kind of like, to me, being a director is sort of like being the captain of a ship where, you know, you have so many people around you that are actually better at their individual thing than you are. You know, they're experts. They have the gaffers, expert at lights, the DPs, expert at cinematography, the actors are wonderful actors. And you're someone whose job is, it's to curate talent and also to make sure that everything moves in the direction that it's supposed to go. You know, like your job is to get the ship from point A to point B um, while also allowing people to to work at their highest potential. You know, you don't want to micromanage to the point where you're tying people's hands behind their backs. Right, right. Um, you hired them for a reason, but you have to have enough vision to keep the ship moving in a straight line. And so I, to me, it's just, it feels, it's so fun, I think, first and foremost. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's really fun. And it is really hard. Um, making my movie was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Um, but it also, like, it's been really special because I've had a lot of young black girls say that, oh, 
your path has inspired me and made me feel like, oh, I can make a movie too. Um, and when I was, even when I was first starting to make this movie, it was before Ava had even popped. And so there's so few African-American directors. There's so few women directors, period. Um, and I think the more we can, the more women directors that we have, um, the more easily the industry will see women as leaders. You know, like I had someone tell me once, as an African-American director, a friend who's a mentor, um, who's pretty established in the industry. And he said, we need to get the men in first. He was talking about the African-American men. We need to get the men in first because they're the leaders. And then once we get the leaders in, then we can bring women up and you know, <laughs> create space for more women directors too. And I was like, that's the problem, that thinking, because you don't think of women as leaders. And if you don't think of women as leaders, then how are, they, how are people supposed to trust them enough to lead a set? And, um, and, and that's like the, I think then the struggle is that historically women haven't been seen as people who can lead. And, um, and so even being in that position where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a leader of this group of people and it's my job to make sure that this movie uh, gets made. I felt just, you know, on the personal level, it was so satisfying and fun, but also it felt good to sort of usurp that stereotype of like people who look like me not being someone who can take charge and lead. Thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that, having tried over many decades to do the same. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not easy and it's a, it's a constant endeavor. It, you know, it, do, it takes more than just once. So what's your next plan? Well, this movie has really, like, I've been so happy to say opened a lot of doors. Um, the, the movie's about a pandemic, crazily. So it's, it's about a girl from South Dakota who moves to Los Angeles to become an actress, uh, but a pandemic breaks out and it's too dangerous to stay in the city. And so she has to go back home and live on a farm with her family, a family that she's been running away from her whole life. Um, she's like a prodigal daughter. And so she has to go home and live on this farm with her family to ride out a pandemic. And so obviously it was very timely as it was being released. It was released in May. Uh, or in, in March, uh, it was it was sold in May and released in August, um, and it's it's been crazy, you know. Like I couldn't get a single meeting before the movie got, came out, or uh, and I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't get. I had all these ideas, but I had nowhere to put them because, again, it's hard to get people to trust you, and it's hard to get people's attention. I think especially when you don't look like a director to them. And that's, that's on the subconscious level. They, they might not even know that's what they're thinking. Um, but, you know, if they're like, oh, that white guy in a baseball hat looks like I, he reminds me of me when I was young. He's got something. I can tell, you know, it's be, and he looks like a director to them because he's looked like every director they've ever known. Um, and so it was really hard even to get meetings. But now that the movie's come out, I, I have sort of like a, a, the proof is a little bit in the pudding. And, um, and so I have a, a, a lot of, I can't really talk about them yet, but a lot of things kind of a brewing, um, <laughs> which has been really, really exciting for me. I'm so uh, happy for yeah. you. I think yeah. that's wonderful. And I'm excited to, to, to know that your, your movie is available. How do people find it? They can find it on all major on-demand channels. So it's on iTunes, on Google Play, on Amazon Prime, on uh, Voodoo, on Vimeo, all of all of the things for you watching on your at home. And tell me the title of the movie again so we know. It's called Before the Fire. Before the Fire, folks. This is something you need to take a look at and enjoy and be inspired in case you have any idea of becoming a director yourself. This is how it's done. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think maybe just that, you know, the way that I got my movie made was by working outside the system. You know, the system wasn't working for us. And so I knew that the only way to be able to prove that I could be a director was to go outside the system and make, and make something on my own. And so I got all of my friends together I used all the resources that I had access to for free and got this movie made. 
And I think it's so possible for people. And it's, and, and especially nowadays where every young person has an iPhone, every young person knows how to edit, every young pe person knows how to upload content to the web. I think that it's democratized this entire process so much where it used to be that there was very specific gate gatekeepers who got to say what was worthy of, of being made and what was worthy of being seen. Um, and so they were also the arbiters of, of taste, of culture, of truth in a lot of ways. And that now those institutions are crumbling a little bit and kids from all over the world can make stuff and, and put themselves at the center of these stories. And I think that is so wonderful and I'm, makes me so optimistic and excited. And so I hope that if any kid is listening to this or anyone's listening to this, they, the one thing they take from it is just nothing can stop you if you, you are a director the moment you decide you are. And you're a writer the moment you start writing. And so if you wanna be a director, start making stuff and, um, and upload it to the internet. And it's okay if it's bad at first, like every art you have to grow and, um, and you can do it. Anyone can do it if I can. I love it. I'm inspired. You know, some people told me to try and write a, a movie script about my life. And I thought, well, I'm not a script writer. And then I tried, told me, eh, it's not so wonderful. But as you say, it can be done. Maybe I should go back and work on it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you know, any pianist, will, they started out just you know, <laughs> packing the keys, playing chopsticks. Like they didn't start out playing Beethoven. They started out playing really badly and practicing every day. And for some reason with films or writing, people want to like, they, they want to be Leonardo da Vinci on their first day. And it's like, that's not how, it's not how anything works. Like you don't see the practice and you don't see the failures of all of your idols, but trust that there's so many failures and there's so much practice that went into it. Um, and so that is something that's just part of the process. I couldn't agree more having written 15 books and yeah. each one of them is better than the last. Yeah. Practice everybody. Practice makes perfect is a saying that's old, but it is always good. Yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on our podcast, Charlie. Thanks and so I'm so looking forward to the response of our readers and I just wish you all the best. And I want to hear how all these meetings turn out. <laughs> so you. maybe this time next year, we'll do another podcast and uh, you'll get us up to date. I would love to anytime. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. And thank you audience for tuning in to another diversity report podcast. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as you have our many others. Stay tuned and we'll be back. Mm -hmm.